Greetings and salutations, everyone. My name is Andrew Kirkhoff, and welcome to my YouTube channel. Today, we're talking about my week five wide receiver starter sits for the 2019 fantasy football season. On today's episode, we're going to be going over news around the National Football League, then going over the matchups at the wide receiver position, then going over my top 36 wide receiver rankings. Before we get into that, let me remind all of you, if you haven't yet already, we are ever so close to surpassing the 10,000 subscriber mark. If you guys haven't yet already subscribed, join the community, click that subscribe button. For those of you who have already subscribed, click the bell notification button to be notified when my latest content is out. And another reminder, click that like button. I really do appreciate that. All the support. Thank you guys. Hey everybody, how's it going? All right, so we're talking wide receivers, but before we do that, let's talk about some news surrounding the National Football League and all that it pertains. Um, there's a lot of news that came out this morning. Um, and a lot of it has to do with wide receivers and a lot of it not so much. So number one, John Ross, wide receiver for the Cincinnati Bengals, has been placed on the injured reserve list. Uh, therefore, due to his injury, um, the next man up would be Auden Tate. Uh, he's a guy that probably uh, wasn't mentioned as a waiver wire matchup for me, for certainly. I did mention him in the video yesterday, but nothing too big. I think uh, his presence sure has an opportunity to grant him some fantasy value this week against the Cardinals, but he is a short time fix until AJ Green is healthy and back. And once that happens, it's going to be the Tyler Boyd AJ Green show, but until then, it's really Tyler Boyd and then sidekick Auden Tate. Uh, so that's one thing to keep your eye out on, okay? Outside of that, um, Case Keenum was seen in a walking boot earlier today, so chances are the QB competition is between Haskins and Colt McCoy. What we're expecting is that Haskins is going to be the starter of this team going forward, and that's not going to change. Um, it's going to hurt the pieces around him uh, a tad bit, but we'll get into that uh, when we're talking about wide receivers because Terry McLaurin is on this list, and I believe he should be. Uh, moving on. Other pieces of information. Christian Kirk is, tip, or is unlikely to play this coming Sunday. Uh, Cliff Kingsbury said that uh, he's been dealing with some injuries, and they're probably going to be playing Andy Isabella as the outside wide receiver, speedster from college, uh, a guy that I thought would have been more implemented in this offense by now, but he has his opportunity this week. Uh, nothing to pick up waiver wire wise, but just you know, keep keep in mind that Christian Kirk is probably going to miss this week. Other information: Tyree Kill right underneath me. Um, I'll, I'll rank him, but he did start practicing today, which is extremely important because um, again, in week one, shoulder injury that he sustained hasn't played since. Um, was practicing or not practicing he was warming up with the team uh, prior to Sunday's game against the Detroit Lions uh, so that was a good sign and now that he's practicing um, I'm not sure exactly what kind of practice he saw whether it was full participation or minimal um, the whole thing is his shoulder and whether or not he can sustain content uh, contact as of right now uh, that's the biggest question mark uh, surrounding him. But if he is good to go, he's definitely on the list to the left of me. Certainly, he deserves to be in the top 12 against the Indianapolis secondary this week if he's healthy and ready to go. Another piece of that offense, Damian Williams practiced. Uh, and if if that continues to trend in the correct direction, um, I don't know what the heck is going to happen in this backfield. Are they going to go back to Damian Williams as the number one? Uh, playing 60% of the snaps and everybody else following suit? Or is it going to be a mixture of a three-headed monster, two-headed monster? I'm not sure. All of these running backs uh, have performed well in this backfield, especially LaShawn McCoy and Daryl Williams in the last two weeks. Um, so it's really a big question mark on whether or not we're going to see anything out of that if he's playing and healthy this coming Sunday. Um, other pieces of information I need to disclose. I'm just looking at this. Saquon Barkley somehow is going to, I guess, come back earlier than expected. Um, he was saw earlier today um, doing some, what, what exactly is the quote? Stretched, working out with training staff, light running, change of direction, looking very good. That's the quote. That's ridiculous. Saquon Barkley is an animal. Like, we know he's a freak, right? He's a freak of nature, Um and he's just one of those superhumans. But, oh my goodness, you're coming back from a high ankle sprain, already working out, already uh, getting back to rehabbing it and getting to the right spot. That looks fantastic for Saquon owners. For uh, Wayne Gallman owners, if you're, you don't own Saquon, doesn't look as good. But, all in all, um, that, that's some pretty good news. Also, the last piece of information I wanted to talk about is um, revolving around the New York Jets. Sam Darnold has not been cleared 
for contact. Um, he, he's been dealing with mononucleosis in the last couple of weeks, uh, which has held him out due to the sickness. And uh, he's lost some weight, hasn't been able to lift weights, um, and hasn't been able to practice. He did practice earlier today, split first team snaps with Nick Folk, the backup. Chances are that Sam Darnold's not going to play this week. And even though it's a juicy matchup against the Philadelphia Eagles, um, he's not going to be able to take advantage of that. I did have a Jameson Crowder on um, the top 36 list, but unfortunately, because of the fact that I'm expecting Sam Darnold not to be playing this week in Philadelphia uh, with the Jets, uh, and I'm expecting him to come back this following week in week six, uh, I'm going to go ahead and just everybody be prepared not to start any Jets this week except for Le'Veon Bell because that would be the only option. And even then, that's going to be tough sliding for him. But that is the news. Thank you. Hopefully, you guys you know uh, got enough influx of information there. Um, and now we can get on to talking about the wide receiver position, and especially the matchups at the wide receiver position going into week five of the fantasy football season. So this this list to the left of me is defenses giving up points to opposing wide receivers on a weekly basis in half-point PPR scoring format. So if we look up and down this list, again, the Eagles give up the most points. I just wanted to mention Sam Darnold because we shouldn't get too excited about Nick Folk coming out and feeding the rock to... You know, Jamison Crowder or Robbie Anderson, it's probably not going to happen um, to the effect that we might think because it's, it's just it's a bad matchup. Um, the Washington Redskins playing against the New England Patriots. That offense of the, um, the Washington Redskins, they're going to struggle because of their rookie there. On top of it, the New England defense has been the best in the NFL. They've been incredible in fantasy. They're going to crush that offense, and they're going to get the ball back for Brady. Brady's going to score a bunch of points. Um, with his wide receiver core for certain. Uh, the Jets, another team that doesn't play well against the secondary. Uh, a guy that I wanted to mention, Deshaun Jackson could play this week. If, if that's the case, I do not mind him against the Jets. He's not going to be on today's list, but that's only because I was wondering whether or not he would be a full participant and whether or not he was going to play. I did not get enough details there, but I wanted to mention him here uh, to let everybody understand that Deshaun Jackson is a good option against this secondary, especially if he's healthy. We haven't seen him since week one. He had a 31-point bomb in half-point PPR, but since then, uh, this team really has missed him, and, and they need that uh, that deep threat back. Uh, moving on, the Giants get to play against the Vikings. The Vikings, and you know what? We're not going to go too much into it because I'm, I'm, I'm talking too much here, but just let's look at this, right? The Giants give up a bunch of points. That's great for Adam Thielen and Stephon Diggs. We have the Saints. Um, didn't really get hurt too much by the Dallas Cowboys passing offense, but they get to take on Tampa Bay, who looked absolutely incredible last Sunday against the Rams in LA. Uh, we have the, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers on the other side of the ball. You know, even though Tampa Bay played well offensively, there's a lot to say that they couldn't stop the Rams either. Um, it, it was a real shootout. They needed that 21 point lead in order to sustain that. The Oakland Raiders struggling, but they're going to be playing against a backup quarterback, Chase Daniels, most likely. The Jaguars, the Dolphins on a bye week, Houston uh, Texans, etc. And then moving on to the more difficult matchups, the Titans playing against Buffalo, likely without Josh Allen, which is going to hurt Buffalo uh, with Matt Barkley at the quarterback position. Moving on, the Seahawks playing against the Rams, the Cardinals um, been pretty good against the wide receiver position, playing against the Bengals. Um, then we have the Bengals themselves, who, you know, the thing is, the Cardinals and the Bengals. It's not that they're fantastic against the wide receiver position. It's more like they're so bad against the run that they get to hide in this kind of a thing. It'll balance out eventually, though. Uh, the Panthers, the Cowboys, the Bills, the Broncos, the Patriots, and the Green Bay Packers. The Green Bay Packers and the Dallas Cowboys, both teams that are not giving up many points in the passing game. Both of those teams play each other this week. Should be an interesting matchup. Anyway, hopefully this helps you guys. These are defenses giving up points to opposing wide receivers on average and a weekly basis thus far this season throughout the first month of the season. Hopefully this helps. Let's go ahead and move on. Let's go back and let's talk about my top 36 wide receivers going into week five of the fantasy football season. Uh, you know what's crazy? I just wanted to mention this because I just got a, a little bit of a notification saying that Hunter Henry doing individual workouts. So the patella fracture that this guy sustained thus far this season is not holding him back. Hunter Henry is a freak of nature, ladies and gentlemen. This is a guy that tore his ACL 
in June of 2018 and was able to come back and suit up for the playoff game in January against the Patriots. This is a guy that is making injuries look like they're nothing. Unbelievable. Hunter Henry is a, uh, man, I don't know, man. It, it, it is an anomaly to say the least. Um, but that's that's great news. Maybe you pick him up, throw him in your IR slot. If you're, need, if you're in need of a tight end, um, it's not a bad idea. All right. Anyway, we're talking about my top 36 wide receivers of week five. I'll be totally honest. This list was pretty difficult to construct because of how inconsistent top tier wide receivers have been and how we, I mean, on a weekly basis, there are guys that we want to we want to trust. DeAndre Hopkins, number two. We want to trust him and we have to trust him blindly because he is who he is and he has done what he has done over the last five years of his career, has been one of the best, if not the best, wide receiver in, in the National Football League. And we have to blindly trust these kind of players. Because the other options that we are presented with, yes, they may be a little bit, you know, they, they could be safe plays, but I'm never going to leave a guy like this on my bench. So it's, it's extremely difficult, but let's get into it, shall we? All right, moving on to my number one. My number one wide receiver of the week is Julio Jones playing against the Houston Texans. I do personally believe this is going to be a shootout. There's a reason why I have Julio and DeAndre Hopkins as my one and two. I think both of these offenses have struggled, and I do think the their defenses are not great. The Falcons defense, the Houston Texans defense, both of them have their flaws and a lot of it in the passing game. I do believe that Julio Jones is going to get back on track. The first three weeks of the season, he had a touchdown in every single game and this past week wasn't able to have that ever elusive touchdown. But a thing that is very promising, the Houston Texans versing number one wide receivers and elite number one wide receivers, that is, against Michael Thomas, gave up 10 catches over 100 yards and against... um, Keenan Allen, he had 13 receptions over 150 receiving yards. We have seen top-tier wide receivers of the um, of respective teams play well against the Houston Texans secondary, and I think Julio Jones is definitely amongst that top tier and deserves to be the number one of the week. Moving on to number two, DeAndre Hopkins. I understand. He is extremely inconsistent in the... Well, you know what? He's not even inconsistent. In the last three weeks, he's been consistent, but consistently bad. That is the unfortunate thing. If you guys saw that that press conference where um, one of the, the people from the press was asking Deshaun Watson, why don't you guys feed the ball to DeAndre Hopkins more? And he was like, all right, do you understand what defense they were playing? They are playing cover four. And he broke down the entire scheme of cover four and what you're trying to do and why, you're, uh, why it's so difficult to feed a guy like DeAndre Hopkins in that. Hopefully, that pisses the Texans off enough to feed this guy 12 targets. The fact that he doesn't see that many targets is a lack of coaching. I don't understand what Bill O'Brien is doing there. They need to feed their best player the ball. Deshaun Watson is not their best player. DeAndre Hopkins far and away is on this team, and they have not been able to feed him properly in order to get him fantasy value. And I really do this think this week, the Falcons can't stop a soul. I've been saying it all week long. I've been saying it for the last month. Their defense cannot stop a soul, and I do not think DeAndre Hopkins is going to fall uh, victim to another one of these five-point games. He should be fine, um, and he should be a fantastic fantasy option this week. He's my number two. All right, moving on to number three, Michael Thomas. Michael Thomas gets to play against Tampa Bay Buccaneers secondary. Um, thus far this season, Michael Thomas has been a 14 fantasy point guy per week in half-point PPR scoring formats, whether that's with or without Drew Brees. That is absolutely fantastic. Saw nine targets last week, caught every single target. Uh, for nine receptions. We know Michael Thomas is efficient. We know last year he had an 85% catch rate. This is one of the best wide receivers in the NFL. He's been extremely consistent and gets an extremely easy matchup at home this week. We saw what that secondary of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers was capable of. They let Robert Woods, they let Cooper Cup, they let um, Gerald Everett, they let um, Brandon Cooks do whatever they wanted throughout that game. And going forward, I know, you know, Jared Goff threw some picks, but those are some, you know, that's Jared Goff. What do we expect? I really do believe that Michael Thomas should have a great game. He's my number three. Moving on to number four, Keenan Allen playing against the Denver Broncos. Here's the thing about Keenan Allen. Last week, a little bit of a disappointment considering how great that matchup was against the, uh, the, the Miami Dolphins. It happens. That's fantasy football, and we have to move on. And that is not to say that, you know, Keenan Allen is any less of a receiver because of that performance. You know, inconsistencies happen, and we got, we're got we going to have to move on from it. Going into this week, I mean, if we go back and look what Keenan Allen was capable of doing from weeks one to three, the guy saw 42 targets in the matter of the first three weeks and scored a touchdown in every single one of those games. 
uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, did he score a touchdown every single one of those? Yeah, I'm almost positive he did. Let me look at this. I don't want to just like blow, you know, info and not be able to back it up. There's, there's. Did he score a touchdown? No, he didn't. He scored three total touchdowns. He did not get one against the Lions. So he scored three. He scored a touchdown in two of the first three games, and he's about 50% rate at the moment. Okay, so I'm glad I corrected myself. But either way, the whole point is that Keenan Allen is the number one of this team. Uh, he needs to be targeted more. Last week, they had the the privilege of not having to do so because the run game was working so effectively with Eckler and Pope and being able to move the ball that way. Um, overall, I think they're going to get back on track. This is a little bit more of a tougher matchup. This is They're playing against a team, the Denver Broncos, that are hungry for a win. They're not going to have Bradley Chubb coming off the edge. They're only going to really have to worry about Vaughn Miller on one side. I think that'll award Phillip Rivers enough time. If Mike Williams comes back, that, he, that helps Keenan Allen even more. And I think this week is my number four, uh, pretty good spot. Moving on to number five, the thumbnail himself, Mike Evans. All right, here's the thing about Mike Evans. Him and Chris Godwin are both on this list in the top 10, in fact, um, and pretty much deserve to be there. If this Tampa Bay Buccaneers offense continues to produce as they have in the last couple weeks against a secondary that gives up a lot of points to the opposing wide receiver position, we've seen that from the Saints. Last week, sure, not so much. That, that defense plays well at home, but... I really do believe Jameis Winston is going to be able to go in there and produce a good number. Let's not forget, guys, the biggest thing that Mike Evans has done throughout his career, besides being a bigger target and besides being a red zone threat, the guy has always been a deep threat as a wide receiver. Let's not forget, last season, he was the second wide receiver amongst all. Uh, He had the second most 20-plus yard receptions last year, only behind Tyreek Hill. This is a deep ball receiver. If Jameis Winston can continue to improve and play as he has done in the last couple weeks, effectively delivering the deep ball to Mike Evans. We're just going to continue to see him succeed after you know a pretty rough start. He's gotten back on track, and he's been playing well. All right, moving on. My number six, Cooper Cup. Coopy Cup. Um, matchup proof. A fantastic wide receiver. Uh, and really just is not slowing down. Him and Jared Goff, that is the offense. And, you know, with, with Gurley being in question mark, with... Brandon Cooks and, and Robert Woods, who's going to score between the two of them? Who's going to have the bigger week? We know consistently it's going to be Cooper Cup, and that is why he continues to stay in this in this top echelon of the wide receiver position. He's been absolutely fantastic, and um, you know he, he's he's incredible. He's my number six. Nothing else need to be said. The guy gets his targets. He finds his work in the red zone, and um, he's he's just great. All right, moving on. Number seven, Amari Cooper has a tough matchup. Plays against the Green Bay Packers. I know for a fact that the Green Bay Packers are not good against the run. They have struggled heavily. We talked about it yesterday with Ezekiel Elliott and how much potential he has this week to right the ship in the correct direction rather than what he did last week with fumbling and and not being able to produce against the Saints. The thing is, the Green Bay Packers know that they cannot stop the run either. It's no secret. They go in the film room, they watch it. They go and they're going to try to adjust and they're going to try to help stop the run because they know the Dallas Cowboys are coming into, into this game looking to run the ball heavily. I believe that is going to open up play action for Amari Cooper and it is going to make it a little bit easier for him. Amari Cooper has caught a touchdown each of the last uh, in the first three games of the season. That is a fact. He was not able to catch a touchdown last week, even though the target counts were there, the receptions were there, and the yardage was there. That ever elusive touchdown, I think, will probably be on his side this week in a more favorable matchup uh, at home, at least, rather than on the road in um, New Orleans. So, Amari Cooper, you're my number seven, baby. All right, moving on to number eight, Adam Thielen. The Minnesota Vikings are a one-dimensional team. And the quote that Adam Thielen said after the game against the Chicago Bears this past Sunday was, uh, we cannot be a one-dimensional team in the National Football League and expect to win games. We have to be able to throw the ball. We have to be able to throw the ball effectively, efficiently, and complete deep ball um, passes. Otherwise, everyone's going to stack the box. Everyone is going to stop our running back, even though he's the best in the NFL, and we are not going to win games. I think that's a call to action to not only Kirk Cousins, but to the offensive coordinator, to Mike Zimmer. This entire scheme needs to change. They need to open it up. They need Kirk Cousins to deliver the ball to Adam Thielen and Stephon Diggs. And I think a matchup as such against the New York Giants this Sunday is the perfect time to get back on track. And to really go back to what you were doing last year. I'm not saying completely abandon this heavy run, fullback, 
uh, pulling guard, pulling tackle, uh, tight end scheme, double tight end sometimes. Uh, I'm not saying a, completely abandon that. I'm just saying you have to be able to expand your offense and feed the ball to your all pro wide receivers, but you have two of them, and um, and really, you know, and get it going. So I think Adam Thielen, um, typically in the NFL, when there's a call to action like that, you see a guy really step up and, uh, and be fed the, the following week. All right, moving on. Number nine, Chris Godwin. Um, he's doing it. Bruce Arian said it. I'm going to get this guy 100 receptions. He's going to be the Larry Fitzgerald of my offense. And he is absolutely delivering on that promise. Him and Jameis Winston, even from the preseason, have been like this. And it's not stopping. Uh, they have been absolutely incredible. Even with all the question marks that surrounded Chris Godwin and his injury this past Sunday. The, oh man, is he going to play? He was, you know, uh, you know, barely participated in practice, blah, blah, blah. Dude came out and balled out this coming Sunday. He's probably going to be healthy against a secondary that is struggling against the wide receiver position. When you have Mike Evans on one side of the field and you are the number two wide receiver of this team and nobody's really paying attention to you sometimes and, and you end up, you know, really causing havoc, Chris Godwin's a monster. He's my number nine. Moving on to number 10, Tyler Lockett playing on Thursday night. Um, speaking of Godwin and how much he was able to destroy that Rams secondary, Tyler Lockett is going to be able to do something similar to that because the issue with the Rams secondary cannot be fixed in five days. That It's not possible. They are not going to be capable of fixing it in that amount of time. It's more of a personnel issue rather than anything. It's not being able to cover guys like this. It's the kind of defense that they play. Sure, you might have Marcus Peters and Aqib Tlaib, but these guys are not what they used to be. And as of right now, uh, I think a guy like Tyler Lockett, who has seen a lot of production, sees himself on the field 90% of the time. Um, really, the, the number one uh, wide receiver, certainly, of this offense. He's a top 10 guy for certain, and uh, that's why he's my number 10. All right, moving on. Let's go ahead and um, let's talk about Odell Beckham Jr. Okay, unfortunately, Odell um, has been very meh. Really, that, that just meh. And that sucks because we drafted Odell Beckham buying into this idea that the the Cleveland Browns would be something different. Now they 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 did put up 40 points this last week, but it would, was mainly due to Nick Chubb and Jarvis Landry. Jarvis Landry is in the concussion protocol. Likelihood is that he's going to miss this game. Now they do have an extra day to meet because they do play on Monday night, so there is a chance that Jarvis Landry is cleared. But I really do believe that Odell Beckham needs to be started. He is who he is. He's OBJ for a reason. We know his skill. We know what he's capable of. They've just got to be able to feed him the ball. Um, and, and he'll get there. I mean, he had an opportunity this past week to throw a, a nice 60-yard bomb uh, for a touchdown. Except, you know, <laughs> if that was Antonio Callaway catching the ball rather than him, um, it would have been a little bit more helpful. Uh, instead of uh, whatever that wide receiver was. I don't even know who he was. It wasn't even Higgins. Uh, Antonio Callaway coming back actually does help OBJ um, in terms of being able to stretch the field and at least help him out there. But overall, if if Antonio Callaway's out there, there is no Jarvis, it's going to be all on OBJ. I don't think that the 49ers defense is good enough to cover him, and I think he will have a good week uh, and try to get back on track. He's my number 11. Moving on to number 12. Similar to OBJ. Juju didn't have a great week. The prior weeks, 10 plus points, okay, he's been fine. Right. He hasn't been what we expected because there is no Big Ben anymore. There is no AB uh, to kind of pull pressure away from him. So now that the Steelers offense is looking and trending towards, hey, we're going to run the ball with Samuels and Connor, and we're going to punish teams with this offensive line, Jalen, I mean, Juju Smith-Schuster has kind of disappeared this past Monday. They didn't need him to produce. That's just the cold hard fact. They didn't need him. Mason Rudolph didn't need him to um, to ball out because you know the game was in the bag very early. The defense played fantastic. They got after Dalton, and the game was pretty much out of hand. So looking at Juju this week, playing against Baltimore, it's secondary, and a defense that hasn't been great this season um, compared to what they have been in, in years prior. I really do think that Juju needs to play. He needs to be in your lineup. I know he's been inconsistent, uh, especially last week could have hurt you, but um, don't hold it against him. I think this week he'll be fine. All right, before we move on to the next page, Tyreek Hill. I did mention I would I would talk about him where I would rank him. At this moment in time, I would probably put him as my number eight or I'd probably put him at number seven, to be honest. I'd probably put him above Amari Cooper. If he plays this week, I'm playing him. I mean, it, it, that's not even close. I'm sure you are as well. Uh, many of us have been waiting for this guy to come back. And you cannot tell me that against the Indianapolis Colts that the Raiders just destroyed this past week. Uh, that defense is going to be able to stop this Mahomes offense, and especially Tyreek Hill. 
Um, whether, you know, he can't deal with contact on his shoulder, it doesn't matter. This dude's going to run past people. He's going to catch the ball over the top of the defense, throw up the deuces, walk in the end zone. Um, so if he's ready to go, I'm ready to start him at my number seven. Uh, you just move down everybody one respectively. But we're just waiting to see if he's he's cleared. All right, moving on, let's talk about my wide receiver twos on this week. Starting at my number 13, we have Julian Edelman. Okay, Edelman is has been in every kind of like every other week kind of guy. Week one, fine. Week two, garbage. Week three, great. Week four, garbage. A lot of that has to do with the fact that this offense really hasn't been put to the test very often. Um, so they don't really have to consistently pass the ball in the second half. They just kind of can disappear. Um, and just be okay with it. I do think that Julian Edelman in this matchup against this secondary has a favorable. I mean, it's very favorable. There's a reason why Josh Gordon is also on this, you know, our wide receiver two list. Uh, it's because I really do think that they're going to throw the ball um, heavily against this um, this secondary. That I, I don't know is Josh Norman out? I saw him go down with an injury. I'm actually curious if Josh Norman's out, then that helps Josh Gordon even more. Um, let me see here. Injury highlights, tough start to the day, blah, 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 Josh Norman. Yeah, we'll get into that in a little bit. But anyway, the whole point is that Julian Edelman at this moment in time, he is the number one of this team. And I think if this offense is going to be passing the ball at all, it's typically going towards him because we haven't seen much from Gordon and or Philip Dorsett consistently. And um, really, we haven't seen much from this offense consistently because these, these matchups have been just free. Their defense does all the work. Brady does a couple things here and there. They run the ball a couple times. It's over. But uh, Edelman, I still think, is a is a pretty good start in this matchup. All right, moving on to number 14, Sammy Watkins. If Tyreek Hill plays, I'm going to adjust Sammy Watkins and move him a little bit lower on my list, but not too low. I think he still stays as a, as a potential wide receiver two option because with Tyreek Hill on the field, uh, Sammy Watkins will not pull number one coverage and will not be double teamed as often, therefore be just running free like he was in week one uh, and having himself a game. So there is a good chance that Sammy Watkins could have a good week if he is, which I'm anticipating, the number one of this team. I still see him as my number 14 um, against the matchup. I know he's been really bad in the last three weeks compared to week one, but that's what you should expect. You should expect 10 points from him. If he doesn't catch that touchdown, there's no upside of 16. All right, moving on to my number 15 wide receiver, Robert Woods. Welcome back, Robert Woods, to 2019. Uh, or just welcome, because the last time we saw you in 2019, you didn't do much in the Super Bowl, and you know you kind of carried that off. But finally, we're able to get back into this offense. What did he have? Like 15 targets, 13 receptions, over 100 receiving yards. Monster game. Much respect. That's fantastic. This coming week, we got to use you more. Robert Woods has to be more implemented in this offense. He needs to continue to see that 10 target kind of thing. If you're not going to run the ball with Todd Gurley consistently, You've got to pass, and you've got to feed your best wide receivers. Robert Woods is one of the most talented. I know there's three talented guys here, but you got to feed them effectively and uh, evenly, in my opinion, in order for this balance or this offense to be more balanced. Um, I really do think that the momentum of Sunday's game is going to carry on to Thursday. And uh, Robert Woods as my number 15 wide receiver. Let's go. Moving on to number 16, Stephon Diggs. Similar to Adam Thielen. I really do think, I mean, he had a, he had a pretty good week this past week. Um, comparatively to what we've seen prior. But I think this is the next step. We are going to see the call to action from Adam Thielen saying that we need to pass the ball more to really affect Adam Thielen and Stephon Diggs. They are both going to have, I mean, it's the giant secondary. This is free. It is truly free this week. Um, I don't care what happened last week. That was a whole uh, mess from the, the Redskins side of the ball. But I really do think Stephon Diggs this week has a very good opportunity in having himself another fantastic um, you know, performance and maybe getting back on track to seeing himself as a top uh, end wide receiver, which we anticipated. So he's my number 16 this week. Number 17, Larry Fitzgerald. With Christian Kirk going down and the matchup against the Bengals on Sunday, it's it's all Larry Fitzgerald. Um, there is a chance that other wide receivers get implemented. There is a chance that David Johnson takes the touchdowns. But, you know, Larry Fitzgerald is the number one of this team. And thus far this season has been that. Going forward in this matchup, I, I cannot see a, a reality in which Larry Fitzgerald isn't playing well or at least stepping up to the um, the task at hand with Christian Kirk down. So uh, Larry Fitzgerald is a, an upper-end wide receiver here as my number 17. Uh, I like him at this spot. Moving on to number 18, Tyler Boyd with, you know, it, it's the same matchup. You know, they, they play against each other this week, Tyler Boyd, Larry Fitzgerald. Tyler Boyd with 
John Ross going down with an injury presents himself a little bit more value here and more dependability. Now, we have seen in the past without the number one wide receiver on the outside, if in fact Tyler Boyd has to move out of the slot, he gets hurt there. But I really do think that as long as he sees more targets, because the the play on, on Monday Night Football wasn't great. Uh, Andy Dalton really did struggle, and he wasn't able to get the ball out of his hands effectively, efficiently, and uh, accurately at all. So going towards you know the future, I think with, with Tate on the outside, Boyd still in the slot position potentially, um, he should be good going in the next couple weeks. Just got to wait until uh, A.J. Green comes back and Tyler Boyd will be even better. But he's still a solid wide receiver too. I'm right, moving on to Alshon Jeffrey. Um, Alshon Jeffrey came back last week, caught himself a touchdown, perfectly fine. Gets the Jets this week, great matchup. No one's going to really be able to cover him. He's a deep threat, uh, big body. Uh, it's just it's, it's free pickings. Alshon Jeffrey needs to start this week. I know many of us kind of avoided it last week, but... Um, he, he was what I had him at like number 26 last week. Um, and I said if he played, um, you know, this week he's healthy, he's ready to go. Um, whether it's Deshaun Jackson, you know, on the field or not, uh, I think anything helps him. Any other, if you can get Deshaun Jackson back, it even helps Alshon Jeffrey even more because it stretches the field, allows him to, um, to not play, you know, uh, have to worry about too much double coverage or any safety help over the top of him. All right, moving on. Let's go ahead and talk about Brandon Cooks, my number 20. I still think all three of these. Rams wide receivers are great, and they should be treated as so. Um, it's it's a real big question of who gets the touchdown, or who's capable of it. Whether maybe Gurley comes and steals too, that's always a possibility. Um, you know, Gerald Everett had one last week. That's probably not as consistent. But I do think that uh, going forward, Brandon Cooks, another one of these top 24 wide receivers, top 20, in fact, has been consistent uh, throughout the entire season and going forward uh, should continue to stay a suit. All right, moving on to 21, Josh Gordon. Uh, Josh Gordon, I mean, hasn't been fantastic. Sure, that that's fine. But it's a really good matchup. They've got to be able to feed one of these wide receivers. Uh, I think if there's ever an opportunity, I mean, he's had a couple in the last couple of weeks. That That's for certain. Um, and he wasn't able to really do much. But a lot of that has to do with target counts because, uh, you know, Brady did struggle last week heavily. And, you know, that happened. But Hopefully, they can get back on track, feed a guy like Josh Gordon, get him back into uh, a rhythm, and I think um, this is the week that they do it against a secondary that has given up a lot of touchdowns to opposing wide receivers. I think um, Allen Robinson, I mean, excuse me, I think Josh Gordon is a good way to go this way, uh, this week, excuse me. All right, moving on. Let's talk about Allen Robinson. Thank you for those of you who corrected me. They are not playing in Oakland this week. They are playing in London. What the heck? Are we really doing London games already in week five? It seems a little early, no? Maybe that's how it always was. But you know, the, you know what was funny? What was, the last time that Derek Carr played in London was last year, right? He played in London and then he got smacked by the Seahawks. It could be the same thing this year. There's always a chance that the Bears get after him. But on the Bears side of the ball, you do have Chase Daniels. Either way, Allen Robinson um, is the number one of that team. Was targeted pretty heavily by um, Chase Daniels in that offense. And, you know, I think it's a pretty favorable matchup. No one's going to be really comfortable. But I do think that the Bears are going to get the ball back so often that, in fact, Allen Robinson's going to have many opportunities to get it done uh, and be a top 24 wide receiver. And that's why he sits at 22. The guy's been pretty consistent all year long. Um, Trubisky, if he was better, would make Allen Robinson even that much better. Um, and that's why he sat outside of the top 24 for much of this season, but um, he's had consistency, and that's exactly what we want to see. All right, moving on to 23, Marquise Brown. Hollywood Brown plays against the Steelers. I do think that this is actually quite a, quite a juicy matchup. An afternoon game on Sunday, Steelers and um, Ravens, both teams that in the past have been very defensive heavy, and that's how matchups have typically broken down. I think this might be one of the higher scoring Steelers Ravens games that we've seen in quite some time um, and I think that Marquise Brown is going to be a lot of this offense yes you can run the ball effectively that's a given right you have you have Lamar Jackson you have Mark Ingram you have a great offensive line but you have to really establish passing the ball outside of just Mark Andrews in the red zone um, so hopefully Marquise Brown can get back on track uh, and that's what I expect from him this week is my number 23 number 24 DJ Moore um, he's pretty much he's the number one wide receiver his team that's for certain but if, in fact, Jalen Ramsey is not going to participate again, and I did hear that the Jaguars declined a deal with two first-round picks for Jalen Ramsey, so I don't know what they want. They want three? Good luck. But uh, DJ Moore, if, in fact, um, 
Jalen Ramsey is not going to play. I mean, this defense is not the same without him. When you don't have your, your the best corner in the National Football League trailing the opposite team's wide receiver, it really does not help. Especially if offensive lines can hold back this pass rush. DJ Moore is going to have himself a pretty good game, similar to what Sutton had last week, if in fact Jalen Ramsey's out. That's why he sits at 24. All right, moving on, let's talk about my wide receiver threes. The last of my top 36, number 25, Tyrell Williams. I did mention that I do believe that the, the Bears defense is going to get after the Raiders, but if in fact they do, and Josh Jacobs can't run the ball consistently, Tyrell Williams will be asked to do a lot. Him and Darren Waller are the number one and two receiving options on this offense. And I do believe Tyrell Williams will see a lot of targets, therefore have some good fantasy value this week. Moving on to 26, Emmanuel Sanders. I do think, again, Emmanuel Sanders, outside of that week three game against the Green Bay Packers, extremely consistent all season long, continues to be a great fantasy option, another wide receiver um, that you know we, we can trust on a weekly basis within this offense. Interesting news that I heard. Emmanuel Sanders might be traded soon. Um, this team is tanking. They're 0-4, and, um, and really, I don't think they have any inhibitions to trying to make the playoffs anytime soon. So, chances are uh, they could field some off- offers on the table. Now, what I did hear is that the 49ers are looking to trade for a established wide receiver such as Emmanuel Sanders. So that is always a possibility of them, you know, getting that. But I don't know. We'll, we'll just have to wait and see what happens there. But this week against the Chargers, I do believe uh, Sanders. Ooh, excuse me. What was that? Some notifications. Um, Sanders should be fine this week um, as another one of these uh, pretty solid number wide receiver threes um, with upside. All right, moving on to 27. If, in fact, Tyreek Hill is out, Demarcus Robinson sits here at 27. If Tyreek Hill plays, Demarcus Robinson pretty much disappears, in my opinion. Uh, he would be the wide receiver three or four within this offense. He would go from playing 90% of the snaps to probably 60, 50 at times. So um, hopefully for, you know, hopefully he still has value if in fact Tyree kills back but um if he's not if Tyree kills gone for this week then we have Demarcus Robinson at 27 all right moving on to number 28 Marquez Valdez Scantling all right here's the thing about MVS uh if Devontae Adams is out because we know that Devontae Adams is not on this list because I expect him to miss the week due to turf toe he still has a pretty tough matchup on hand he's going to be playing against a Cowboys defense in Dallas that is pretty good overall as an entire defense. Have played better in the last couple of weeks, especially with their pass rush. Um, Robert Quinn, especially. But Marquez Valdez Scantling hasn't really, you know, really been able to produce much. It's whether it's the question is whether it's him um, or Geronimo Allison or Jimmy Graham or Aaron Jones catching that touchdown. Sure, Marquez Valdez Scantling could come out and catch, you know, eight passes for 78 yards. That's not a bad game. That's 12 points. But if he scores that touchdown, he can throw his, uh, throw him up. But I don't think that eight catch, seventy eight you know yards is in his books either. You know maybe six catches, fifty four yards. That's what we should expect, and that's what I'm expecting. That's why he's at twenty eight. All right, moving on to twenty nine, Sterling Shepard. The only reason I'm concerned about Sterling Shepard is because of Xavier Rhodes. Uh, that defense is not a joke. They're going to bring a lot of pressure, and they're going to make. Um, Daniel Jones struggle. Therefore, you know, Sterling Shepard Shepherd will struggle. They are also getting back Golden Tate this week. I don't know what kind of production or usage he's going to see. Therefore, he's not on the list. But I do think that if, in fact, Golden Tate becomes a very viable option, it could hurt Sterling Shepard going forward. Uh, but this week, he's my number 29. Moving on to 30, Cortland Sutton. Um, Casey Hayward's going to be on him. He's going to have pretty good coverage on him. Comparatively, last week in which he was playing against backups and A.J. Boyd he's just, you know, playing like a bum. Cortland Sutton's going to have a pretty good um, matchup this week in terms of he's going against good competition. So at 30, I'm pretty comfortable there. I think as a wide receiver three, um, the amount of targets he's seen this season, you know, seven, seven, eight, nine, um, it's trending in the right direction. And I think it, it really is going to benefit him uh, throughout the season. If in fact, you know, I mean, something happens with Emmanuel Sanders, he ends up getting traded. It only helps Sutton, but going forward as of right now, Sutton uh, against the Chargers should be fine as a wide receiver three. Moving on to my 31, Curtis Samuel. Uh, like I was mentioning with DJ Moore, if Jalen, Sa- uh, J- sorry, <laughs> if Jalen Ramsey is not in there, and he is not playing. Again, this defense does not look the same. Um, Kyle Allen will be able to at least sit back in the pocket, have a little bit better opportunities to feed these receivers. Uh, has fed you know Curtis Samuel more than DJ Moore thus far this season, um, while Kyle Allen has had his tenure there. Um, and I think right now, you know, Curtis Samuel could put something together. They got to use him more though. They got to use him with some jet sweeps, some bubble screens. Um, they got to run the ball with him. 
You know, we got to remember that, you know, Curtis Samuel was a guy that in college ran for 700 yards and received for 700 yards in a single season. No one in that year was even close to doing that. Um, so, again, he, he's a versatile player. They just got to use him more. Moving on to 32. Now, I can understand if you are someone at this moment in time that has been burnt by Calvin Ridley in the last two weeks and you're saying, Andrew, I will not play him. I will actually drop him. If I can't talk you out of just at least keeping him on your roster because I really do believe he has value, I'm going to be putting him out as my number 32 this week because I have a hard time thinking that Calvin Ridley in a shootout as such against the Texans is going to struggle heavily to where he just disappears. Yes, I do have Mohamed Sanu on this list. Austin Hooper has been incredible. Um, you know, Julio Jones is still on that offense. And then we saw Devontae Freeman catch you know seven passes the other day. It hurts Calvin Ridley, certainly. But I still do think he's the number two wide receiver of this team. Um, and if not, you know, he needs to catch a touchdown sometime soon. You can't play this bad for this long. It's it's another one of these. I know he's not an Odell or a Juju, that which we have to trust him every week. But I, I don't know. I just have a feeling this week that he'll be fine. All right, moving on to 30, uh, 33, DJ Chark. The number one of the Jaguars. Perfectly fine with him. Um, again, a little bit of struggles last week. Uh, a lot of it had to do with the fact that they never really had to pass the ball consistently considering how good Leonard Fournette was. Uh, so DJ Chark as of right now, uh, I, I think he's a good wide receiver three. Um, he has proven that he is the number one of his respective team and going forward should be fine. Uh, he's my number 33. Moving on to 34. No matter who starts at quarterback, whether it's Josh Allen or Matt Barkley, I really do think that Cole Beasley, um, the targets cannot be under you know sold. He, he's had 22 targets in the last two weeks. That is fantastic. 10 in one game, 12 in the other. Um, if that continues to trend in the correct direction, whether you play against the Titans or not, uh, I do think that he's going to be fed. Barkley's going to have to get the ball out of his hands if it is him. Josh Allen always loves to throw him the ball, uh, and that's that's going in the right direction. So I like Billy Beasley at 34. Moving on to 35, Mohamed Sanu, another guy that has seen you know six targets a game, and then this past week blew up for a 12-target game um, and have him, had himself a pretty good game overall. The question is, can we potentially play so many Falcons offensive members, even though how bad this offense has been in the past, not being able to get in the end zone? I still think these guys are consistently going to throw the ball. Uh, this offense does not want to run the ball. They, they throw the ball nearly 70% of the time, and that's not changing. So uh, I think Mohamed Sanu is not a va- bad option this week, uh, considering how many other guys that are you know kind of iffies. Um, moving on to my last of my top 36, Terry McLaurin. I really wanted to mention Terry McLaurin because... I do think that no matter what, this Redskins offense has to throw the ball. He's, he might have, you know, um, Stephon Gilmore on him, but garbage time is pretty tricky. Garbage time could figure something out. I was thinking, do I want to put a guy like DJ um, D, DK Metcalf on this list? Do I want to put a guy like Robbie Anderson on this list? Um, there's no Galladay. There's no Marvin Jones. Do, you know, like who do I want to put on this list? Who do I personally think has a better opportunity to have a decent week in all of these matchups? And I do think that Terry McLaurin cannot be ignored. I'm not saying that he's 100% a start. There's a reason why he's at 36 is because he's on the fringe of being a guy that he's outside of the top 36. And I do think that this matchup is extremely difficult, but I would trust him if as long as he's healthy. If he's healthy and ready to go, I don't mind putting him in. I do think that a lot of the inconsistencies of the Redskins offense last week was because Terry McLaurin wasn't out there. If he was out there, Case Keenan probably would have never been replaced in my eyes. Um, and I think McLaurin's is pretty good. He's, he'll be able to figure it out. All right. That's pretty much it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, everybody, for watching, taking your time out of your day to spend it with me, talking about fantasy football, and uh, doing what we enjoy. Thank you guys again. Tomorrow will be quarterbacks and tight ends. And hopefully um, everything is settled in terms of waiver wires. Thank you guys again. If you haven't already, check out my Patreon. Down in the description is the link. Uh, All of your 2019 fantasy football questions answered, private live streams, uh, flex rankings, etc. Thank you, everybody, again for watching. And until tomorrow, I will see you guys. Peace.